want to continue in our brief survey of the book of Philippians. Philippians, we've looked at chapter 1. Uh, we looked at chapter 2 last week in chapter 1. We entitled the message, What Difference Does It Make? As long as Christ is preached, what difference does it make? Whether well, one does it out of hatred, one does it out of spite, one does it out of uh, trying to show somebody else up. Preach Christ. That's what Paul says. Even though I'm in prison, I'm happy that I'm in prison and Christ is being preached. Last week we looked at um, chapter 2 and we said, Mom, work out. It was Mother's Day. And so we encourage the moms, and not only moms to work out, but Christians to work out. Because Paul says, work out your own salvation. And today I want to um, take a look at chapter 3 very, very briefly. And I want to take a look at, um, well let's start at verse 1. I think just to get the gist of this passage, let's look at verse 1. So Philippians chapter 3 Verse 1. Paul is saying finally here, and this finally does not mean this is the last thing I'm going to say because we know he says the same thing in chapter 4. Uh, so this is basically in summary to what he has said to this point. He says, finally, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write to you again about this is no trouble for me and is a protection for you. Watch out for dogs. Watch out for evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, the ones who serve by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ uh, Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh. Although I once also had confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised the eighth day, of the tribe of Israel, of the, I mean, of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. But everything that, is, that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them filth, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know him, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already reached the goal or am already fully mature, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I have also been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, Forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Therefore all who are mature should think this way. And if you think differently about anything, God will reveal this also to you. In any case, we should live up to whatever truth we have attained. Join in imitating me, brothers and observe those who live according to the example you have seen in us. For I have often told you, and I'll say again with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. They have focused on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. Will you go back with me to verse 12? Verse 12, and this is where we get our title for today. Paul says, not that I have already reached the goal or am already fully mature, but I make every effort to take hold of it because 
I have also been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Paul says he's been seized by Christ. He's been seized by Christ. Seized by Christ. I don't know if you realize it, but as believers, God grabbed you. Jesus snatched you. Jesus apprehended you. He has you on lockdown. And so many times as believers, we think we've got God on lockdown. He's at our beck and call. But yeah, Paul says, I, I, I'm at this point where I feel like I'm not already attained it. I do think I got a little bit of grasp on it. But that's nothing compared to the grasp, the seizure that Christ already has on me. And so when we think we've gotten somewhere in life, y'all, we really haven't gotten there, have we? What we have is because of who has us. Christ has us. So many times people talk about what they have. I remember in a recent conversation, I was telling someone about, well, uh, I have this, I have that, you know, I'm retired, I got a little bit of money in the bank, and, you know, $35 is more than what I had when I was working. You know, I don't have to worry about if I go to McDonald's, as you've heard me say before, and I, and I buy a $5 Happy Meal, if that's going to negatively affect my bank account. I can buy two of them now, and, and then I will have to start worrying. But I don't have to worry about the one. But it's not about what I have. It's not about what I've attained in life. It's not what I've grown to. It's all about Christ and what he has done in my life. And so let's pray and let's briefly take a look at this, this chapter, do a quick survey of chapter 3. Father, we thank you for the privilege of standing before you and your people uh, to open up your word. Father, we pray that it would be all about you, never about me. You come to the forefront, and Lord, I pray that I would be decreased, that you would be glorified. That your word find fertile soil, good soil, in the hearts of the hearers. That we might become what you would have us to become. Testimonies and witnesses. We will be bearers of our crosses. We will be the ones who keep Jesus Christ on display. This we ask in his name. Amen. In reading this chapter, you find out that Paul starts out and he says, finally, he's talking to the church at Philippi again. He wants the brothers and the sisters there to certainly rejoice in the Lord. But he says something interesting in verse 1. He says, to write to you again about this trouble, this is no trouble for me and is protection for you. And then he goes on in verse 2 to say, watch out for dogs, watch out for evil workers, watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. Paul is, is, is taking somewhat of a sarcastic or severe look at Jews. The church at Philippi was founded by Paul uh, through Lydia. They were down at the, water, at the riverside, remember? And they were worshiping. In the jail at Philippi, the, Philipp, uh, the Philippian jailer cried out to Paul, what must I do to be saved? And so people came to faith in Jesus Christ, but seemed like everywhere Paul went and he established churches, there were Jews or Jewish converts, um, those who believed in Jesus Christ, and they thought that they had to make Gentiles, who the Jews called dogs, uh -huh, had to make them follow the law of Moses. And so this group that would follow down behind Paul and try to undo what he had already done, those are characterized as Judaizers. And as Judaizers, again, they wanted the, the Gentiles to follow the Mosaic law to add to their faith for salvation. And so there are people today who want to tell you to be saved, yes, you have to have faith now to keep your salvation. You got to do this, 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 and this. So we've got some modern day legalists, some modern day Judaizers, shall we say. Uh, and so what Paul does is he kind of cryptically talks to the church at Philippi and he says, watch out for dogs. In Palestine and in the Roman Empire at that time, but in, specifically in Palestine, there were wild dogs. They were considered to be filthy. They were dirty. 
They ate anything and everything. And that's why Jews refer to Gentiles as filthy dogs. And so Paul now takes their term and turns it back on the Jews. And he tells the Gentiles, y'all watch out for the dogs. He didn't, not even the dogs, he says, but also watch out for evil workers. Jews thought that Gentiles were evil and that Jews were holy simply because of them having the law and them following the law. So he now turns that on his head against the Jews. Watch out for evil workers. And the third thing he says is watch out for the mutilation. Jews thought they were somebody because they were circumcised. That was a sign given to Abraham for the Jew. Every male Jew had to be circumcised the eighth day after he was born. And if one wanted to become a Jew, a proselyte, then that person as an adult or whatever age he was would then have to be circumcised. And I want you to understand they did not have Lodacane during those days. Mm. 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 <laughs> They didn't have painkillers for these adult men that wanted to follow Yahweh. They had their foreskin cut. And the word circumcised means to cut around. So what Paul uses here in talking to the Philippians, he uses the word not cut around, but he uses the Greek word that means to cut off. So he says to them, these Jews who would have you follow their law, they're actually trying to cut you off. Because if you add anything to your faith to salvation, then your salvation is now vain. It's empty. It's of none effect. So Paul says, you watch out for those who would mutilate the flesh. And so as we continue on look at verse 3 Paul says this to them he says for we are the circumcision the ones who serve by the Spirit of God we boast in Christ Jesus and then he says we put no confidence in the flesh for the Jews it was circumcision was a badge of honor and so maybe in their thinking it was if I can impose my rules, my regulations, my customs and traditions on the Gentiles, then they would have some kind of semblance of maintaining control. What do you mean, Stephen? Well, here's the, here's the thing. The Jews were God's chosen people, correct? They were supposed to be the head and not the tail, right? They were supposed to be the lender and not the borrower, right? They were supposed to be the ones who would bless, and if everyone who blessed them would be blessed. Everyone who cursed them would be cursed. And so in their estimation, because God had chosen them, they were above everybody else. And so now since salvation has come to the Gentiles, let's hold on to some semblance of our status some semblance of our control and let's make them suffer circumcision just like we had they got to look like us they got to act like us and can I say this very candidly but also very cautiously that has been part of the heritage in America for many years for many many years I'm not trying to be insensitive here but I'm just trying to be truthful when there is one people group that tries to control another people group in the name of God, mm -hmm. it is sin. Yeah. Yeah. So whether it is whites against blacks or blacks against whites or yellows against reds or browns against uh, yellows, one people group trying to control another people group in the name of God, it is sin. To kind of bring that, and this isn't part of the sermon, so this is going to run a little bit longer. All right. <laughs> Did you notice this morning, as we were singing the hymns, we didn't have the normal keyboard, we didn't have Paris. The songs didn't, didn't sound like what you would normally hear in a predominantly black church, right? Mm -hmm. We didn't have our 2-4 beat, you know, it won't real fast. Mm -hmm. You didn't have those gospel chords. Who says it's got to be that way? Amen. Who says it has to be that way? Amen. What's wrong with, the, with, with, with an acoustic guitar? Nothing. 
and, 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 and what we may consider to be some country courts. Are we here to serve ourselves? Are we here to impose our culture? Come on now. Are we here to impose our culture? Are we here to worship the God of heaven? Paul was saying to the Philippians, don't let these Jews come in here and impose their culture on you because you have been saved by grace. Paul went on to say that with some people, turn with me to Galatians chapter 6. And so with some people maintaining their culture, maintaining their customs, their traditions, their badges. Mm -hmm. As I said before, it's a matter of control. Look in Galatians chapter 6 verse 12. Paul writes to the church at Galatia and he's warning them about the same situation about these Judaizers. He says in verse 12, those who want to make a good, what? Impression. Those who want to make a good impression in the flesh are the ones who would compel you, force you to be circumcised, but only to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. They're doing this so they don't have to suffer for the, cost of, for the cross of Christ. We are called as believers to suffer for the cross and the cause of Christ. Uh, if, it, if it causes me to be on the outs with black folk, mm -hmm. Jesus is more important. Amen. If it causes me to be on the outs with my family, Jesus is more important. Amen. And I just have to suffer. Look at verse 13. Paul goes on to say, For even the circumcised didn't keep the law themselves. They're trying to make you do it, but they didn't keep it themselves. However, they want you to be circumcised in order for what reason? To boast about your flesh. I got you. You just like me. Not you're just like God, but you're just like me. Verse 14. But as for me, I will never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The world has been crucified to me through the cross, and I to the world. For both circumcision and uncircumcision mean nothing. What matters instead is a new creation. And then Paul says in verse 16, May peace come to all those who follow this standard and mercy to the God of Israel. Amen. Can't follow our standards. We must follow God's standards. And so back in um, Philippians chapter 3, what the Judaizers failed to realize is that it was not in the symbols of their relationship with God that made them different or superior to other people. It was God who selected them to be his witnesses, his testimonies. They were supposed to have been an uh, uh, example to the ancient world of God's love, his mercy, his grace, his provisions, his providence, and even God's uh, forgiveness. Rather than having God to themselves and that idea resulting in some misguided, misunderstood, and misinterpreted elite status in the world, they failed to realize that it was God that had them. God was the one who had seized them. So Paul writes to this uh, church at Philippi, and he tells them that he's not going to boast in anything but in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 4 for me, uh, verses 4 through 6. Paul says, if anyone could boast, it would be me, and I could boast because of my personal and my fleshly achievements. On those grounds, I could boast. Notice what he says in these verses. He talks about how he could boast. He has a pedigree and he has uh, some orthodoxy that he can rely on. So look at his pedigree, so to speak. He says, of his birth, I was circumcised on what? The eighth day. Which means, and, and, and what he's trying to convey to them is, I'm not a proselyte. I'm not a, conver a convert to Judaism. I was born a Jew. It was on the eighth day my parents followed the law explicitly and circumcised me. Not only that, I'm an Israelite. Even though Paul was from Tarsus, what he was saying is that both of his parents were Israelites. That he was purebred. 
a true Jew. And so whatever cultural and whatever racial privileges that his ethnicity afforded him, he had it. Mm. I'm an Israelite. Any of us take pride in our nationality? Mm. You know, one of, the, one of the worst times I had when I was working in um, uh, the federal government system, working at Norfolk Naval Shipyard, was when I had to go abroad. Because even though I was an American and we got this American pride, this pride of nationalism, you know what, over in Europe, they don't care about that. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we were told to keep our American passports hidden. Because you're hated over there. I ain't done nothing to y'all. No, Stephen hadn't done anything. But those who take exorbitant pride in their nation mm -hmm. and try to impose that on everybody else now makes it bad for somebody like me. Right. Mm -hmm. Can I bring it to a more practical place? Are all police officers bad? No. No. I just saw on Facebook this, this week one of my Facebook friends, her brother became a Portsmouth police officer. And I live in Portsmouth. And you know what living in Portsmouth in the police department right now? There's this thing about it's racist. Are all police officers racist? No. Out of everyone in that class that graduated with that young man, there was only one white male. Everybody else was either a black female or a black male. So I can't say police are bad. But I ain't saying they're all good either. That's right. Can I be honest? No. Are all black folks bad? No. Are all white folks bad? No, no, no. I can take pride if I want to in my ethnicity, but I should not because Paul said he was not going to boast in his ethnicity. Amen. If I'm going to boast about anything, I'm going to boast about the fact that Jesus Christ recognized me as a sinner. And he came and he seized me because I cried out to him. Paul says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm an Israelite. I'm pure bread. Then he says, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. More reason to boast. That was the tribe that gave Israel their first king. That was the tribe that stood along with Judah and they became the southern kingdom. It was a tribe in which the, na the, the, national, the national capital existed. It was Jerusalem. It was the tribe where the city of God was. Paul says, I'm a bad somebody. <laughs> Paul said, I got it going on. Not only that, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Even though I was in Tarsus, I still spoke the original language. We were in a Greek-speaking city, but at home we maintained the language. We maintained the customs. We maintained the law and the doctrines. Paul said, you know what, even as a Pharisee, I'm so bad, I was the, I was the best of the bad sex. I was a Pharisee. If anybody adhered to the law, it was a Pharisee, and I was a Pharisee. I was the one that told everybody else that this is what the law says, and you better do it. So if anybody can boast, I can boast. And he says, I was so good at this that I went around persecuting the church. I harassed Christians. I made life difficult for them. I attacked them. He killed them. Mm. Paul says, and on top of all of that, here's the seventh thing he says about what he can take pride in, what he could boast in. He says, when it came to the law, I was faultless. Not that he was sinless, but if he did sin, he brought the appropriate sacrifice. You ever take pride in being holy? Come on now. Do we look down our noses at other folk when they're not as holy as we are? Mm -hmm. That's what Paul is saying. Now, if anybody could talk about how good he is, I have very few peers. We talk about the one percenters. Paul says, I would, he, Paul, Paul could say, I was in the point nine 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 seven eight six three percent Nobody was closer to God than I was. I'm somebody. Maybe Paul was the MC Hammer of his day. Uh, Paul, 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 Paul might have written the song, Can't Touch This. 
And so for you other preachers out there, when y'all want a sermon title, there you go from that verse. Can't touch this. <laughs> Paul said, you can't touch what I got going on. <laughs> but he said, you know what? It's all lost to me. Let's go to verses 7 through 11. Paul, Paul refused to boast in his personal and fleshly uh, accomplishments because he viewed Christ as more valuable. Do you see Christ as more valuable than yourself? Paul says, but everything that was a gain to me, I considered to be a loss because of Christ. Paul uses, Matt would appreciate this, Paul is using some accounting terms now. He's, he's talking about, I've looked at my life and I've evaluated my life and I've got my profit column and I've got my loss column. And in my profit column, I've got all these things. But then when I look at Jesus, <laughs> when I look at Christ and what he's done for me, I, everything that's in my profit column now somehow results in a zero. It's nothing. And everything that's in my lost column that is now that has Christ as a head, it now is profit unto me. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't measure up. It's like standing me beside my wife. She's beautiful. Yes. And I, I'm just arm candy for her. You know what I'm saying? You know, I mean, she, 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 I, I, I might make her look bad, but she looks so good that my zero doesn't even matter. Just keep her looking good. Some husbands ought to say amen in here. Amen. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, amen. Mother Day is over with, but we still got to give them credit. <laughs> Paul reevaluates his life. He sees his gains, his accomplishments, his accolades, his achievements, and he concludes that they are all lost. And so he puts all of his national, racial, ethnic, ethical, accomplishments, educational accomplishments, personal accomplishments, all of those, they are their loss. How many degrees do you hold? How many raises and bonuses have you got? When you put that in light of Jesus Christ, it should come up as nothing, as a loss. Paul says, what's more important is that I know Christ. And this is that word that means an experiential, intimate knowing of Christ. You know what? Sometimes we can't really get to know Christ as we should, intimately, until we've gone through something. We got to go through some stuff. And so this, 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 this teaching, this preaching that's going on today where Christians don't go through anything. And that proves God's love and that proves God's uh, approval of you. That's just like those Judaizers. It's false doctrine. I've learned more about Christ. Yeah, I got saved at age six and now I'm, I'm 60 years old. So that's 54 years in knowing Christ. But I know him a whole lot more and a whole lot deeper and a whole lot sweeter and a whole lot better now because I've gone through some stuff. Think about what you've been through. And does that make Christ more real to you? Paul says, everything I've gained, my worldly status is useless. It's of none effect in viewing the surpassing value, this extravagant value of knowing Jesus Christ. All that he had previously gained didn't matter. You know what mattered to Paul now? Like what we looked at in chapter 1, verse 18, that Christ is preached. That's what mattered. That's what really mattered. That he's preached as the Savior and he's the Messiah of the world. What mattered to Paul was that salvation was by grace through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know what mattered to Paul? Was that one could rejoice in Christ even though he's in prison. Even though he's going through cancer. Even though he has marital issues, even though he's having financial issues, he can still what? Rejoice in Christ. 
Paul says, it doesn't matter about my literal, my, my real circumcision. What really matters is the circumcision of the heart by the Spirit of God. When God begins, when he goes in there and he starts cutting some stuff out of you. <laughs> that really matters, doesn't it? What, what really mattered to Paul, what was very important to Paul was worshiping God in spirit and not merely in ceremonies. <coughs> Did you hear JT this morning? <coughs> last Sunday morning this time, he's laid up in the hospital. The doctor's put, drawing blood. When I went to go see him last Sunday evening, he says, oh good, you're not the vampire. When the nurse came in. <laughs> <laughs> and then about 20 minutes later, the phlebotomist comes in. I said, JT, here's the vampire. And she drew some more blood. But he was happy about he's here where he can worship Christ on today. Some seven days later, he's in the house of God, fellowshipping with the people of God. Worshiping God. Paul says his game was not a personal law-based righteousness, but it was righteousness that is found in Christ through faith. It's a righteousness that's based upon faith in God. And then in verse 10, Paul says that the greatest value was knowing that Christ had raised from the dead and he wanted to know God. He wanted to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And what's the next part of that? And the fellowship. The fellowship. The communion, the commonality, the sharing in Christ's sufferings. At this point in his life, he no longer rested in the flesh. So now Paul was going to say, I can't take this. No, that's not what he said. <laughs> Paul said, this is what I want. This is what I'm going after. Look at verse 12. Paul recognizes, even at this stage, that he was immature. He says in verse 12, not that I have already reached the goal. I haven't reached the finish line yet. He now switches from um, an accounting illustration to an athletic, a race illustration. He said, I'm running this race and I'm stretching to reach the goal, but, I have not, uh, but I'm not already fully mature. But I make every effort to, hold, to take hold of it because I have also been taken hold of by Christ. I want to reach my goal. I want to get there. I want to struggle to get there. I want to strive to get there. But, and I want to hold on to Christ. But one thing I've, I've realized, and this is some 30 years perhaps after Paul has gotten saved, and Paul is saying, you know what? With as, with as much as I know about Jesus, I've been tutored enough to know I don't know it all. Mm -hmm. I'm mature enough to know that I got to know some more. The more that I know that I know, the more that I know that I don't know. Yeah. Paul says, I'm, I'm, I'm immature in Christ. Who would think that the prince of preachers, the, the, the lead apostle would say, I'm immature. But that's what humility, and that's what viewing yourself in front of Christ. I am not there yet. Paul no longer could say, can't touch this. <laughs> Paul, was, Paul might have changed the song there. He touched me. Yeah. And, I, and I want him to touch me. Yeah. Paul, says, Paul says, I'm reaching for it. I'm trying to get it. But one thing I'm sure about is that Christ has got me. Yes, sir. He sees me. That's good. <sighs> it was not Paul simply asking to take hold of Christ, but more so that he had been taken hold of Christ. Christ had acquired him, had seized him. And Paul says this is a whole lot better. When did, when did Jesus seize Paul? Remember in Acts, when Saul was going about and he had led us from the council to go and, and to persecute the church. He's on the road to Damascus and on that road there's this bright light and it knocks him off his beast. And Paul says, I heard this voice saying, Saul, Saul, <laughs> why you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. I'm the one that you are attacking. I'm the one that you are harassing. Is Jesus. And then what did Jesus do? He said, I got, I got control of you now. 
Here's what you're going to do. You're going to get up from the, off this ground and you're going to go into the city and you're going to find a street that's by coincidentally the name of street. <laughs> See, you, you were going this way thinking you would do it, but I'm putting you on straight street now. And when you get there, you're going to be blind. And I'm going to send a guy by the name of Ananias to come, and he's going to come pray for you after about three days. And then you're going to receive your sight. And after you've received your sight, then you're going to be a witness for me. Yes, Paul says, Jesus seized me. Yes, sir. Can you go back to the day when the Lord seized you? Yes, Where were you when he got a hold of you? People say, I sought the Lord. No, you won't. You won't seek in the Lord because the Bible tells us there's none that seek after him. He's the one that sought us. Amen. When did he find you? And when did he get a hold of you? Were you sitting at a bar? <laughs> huh, Jack? <Yeah. laughs> Were you in your bedroom? Were you in a church? Had you heard the gospel and it grabbed a hold of your heart and you just, it just, it just wouldn't let you go? Yes. Aren't you glad that the Lord seized you? Amen. Just like he seized Paul for his plan, his purpose, and his will and to be a preacher unto the Gentiles. You know, God has seized you as well. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose for your life. That's why he's gotten a hold of you. And I want to close with this, verses 13 and 14. Paul says, brothers, I do not consider myself to have already taken hold of it. I haven't grasped it yet. I haven't seized it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prized promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. What is Paul saying? In this analogy now, as I say, he's, he's using this analogy as, as a runner. And some of you are athletes. I believe Sharice was a sprinter or a runner when she was in high school and college. And so I don't know that much about running because the only running I ever did was perhaps when I was running from a dog. <laughs> Or running to the lunchroom. <laughs> or running and chasing after Sheila. <laughs> Sheila was running from me. And you know what would happen? Every now and then she looked back. And when she looked back, the more she looked back, the more I gained on her. <laughs> the closer I got. And then I finally could reach out and I could grab her. See, she got distracted. <laughs> and, I, and I intended to, to distract her because I wanted to catch her. But we can't let those things around us and behind us distract us. Because see, if we get distracted, then we're not going to be caught by Jesus. We're not going to achieve our goal. Those things will now come and seize us rather than us being seized by Jesus Christ. I'm glad she got distracted. But you know what now? In her life, I can't be a distraction to her because as a child of Jesus Christ, as, the, as a daughter of God, she's got to keep her eyes on the prize. Has the Lord seized you? Or are you concerned about things that are around you and are those things distracting you? Good word. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. Thank you for implanting in us the desire to live for you. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us all because there are times when the world envelopes us and we tend to take our eyes off the prize that's coming to us, not from the world, but out of the world, from heavenly places. Forgive us for that, Lord. And help us to be as Paul. To recognize that you have us. Not to take pride into, in our accomplishments, but rather keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. Knowing that you initially seized us. 
thank you for seizing us and bringing us to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray and we thank you. Hallelujah. 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 I want to let you know that my worship.